All right, ladies and gentlemen, if I can have your attention, please. We're here today to see our DUI reenactment. This is a reenactment of a uh, accident. I want to thank, before we get started, the uh, local police municipalities for coming out to help us, the ambulance crew, um, the fire department for being here. I want to thank all our volunteers that have made this possible. Um, and I ask for your undivided attention for about the next 20, 25 minutes as we run through this DUI reenactment. I'm going to turn it over now to our narrators, Dan and Sienna. DUI, driving under the influence of alcohol and or controlled substances in Pennsylvania kills, injures, and destroys families. The following presentation will hopefully make you think about the possible fate of a DUI collision. The presentation, although not an actual collision scene, should help you visualize the possibilities. However, the outcome is never the same for individuals or families. Some face arrest. Some have injuries that never go away. Others die. Please give us your undivided attention for the next 15 minutes as we simulate an emergency services response to a reenactment of a DUI collision. Two vehicles are traveling home after a fun night out, friends following each other home. The vehicles are operated at a high speed, racing down the road, following way too close to the other car. Everybody knows each other. They all just left the same party. The weather is a warm on a spring night, a little fog. The vehicle occupants do not know that their lives are about to be forever changed. One of the vehicles is being operated by an 18-year-old female driver with female passengers. The driver has consumed two beers in the past hour. She also took a few pills. A friend gave them to her. The driver was going to drink less than the others, so she could drive, but she didn't think the pills were a big deal. The passengers had consumed more alcohol. One smoked some marijuana. They wanted to get home after a night of drinking and smoking. They all knew the driver. Their friend consumed some beer. No big deal. She can get us home. No problem. Nothing horrible will happen to us. Home is only two miles away. A couple of drop-offs and we are done. We will get home in no time. The driver thinks, I'm hungry, I want to get home. She rolls down the windows and turns up the radio. What they did not know was that the driver feels buzzed, a little drunk and a little tired, and she had never had those pills with the beer she took. This was a weird feeling. The driver is impaired from the alcohol and pills. The alcohol and pills affect all motor functions. The effect of alcohol pronounces action and response time. Mix in the pills and the reactions are exaggerated as a result. The vehicles travel down the road going 52 miles per hour in a 35 zone, 75.92 feet per second. That's almost eight car lengths in a second. One driver forgets to turn the car headlights on and no one buckles a seatbelt. We never use them, they say. The driver tries to focus on the road. The steering wheel turns slowly left. Four-tenths of a mile later, the driver fails to focus on the road again. Her eyes leave the road. Only a half, a half a second later, long enough to travel 38 feet. The vehicle starts to drift across the yellow lines that protect it from a collision. The friends following behind in the other car think that this is a game. They start to drive extremely close to the lead vehicle. The driver of the car sends a text message while driving to the other driver. Ha ha, very funny. The lead driver overcorrects, jerks the wheel back right. The lead driver decides to turn into the school lot off Snyder Road, making that turn at 52 miles per hour. The following vehicle pulls right up to the bumper and contacts the lead vehicle. The two vehicles collide. 4,000 pounds versus 3,000 pounds generates a powerful collision that is now accelerated by the speed of the two vehicles as they turn. The two cars come to a rest in a tangled mess on the road. Damage is severe to both vehicles, bad enough that nobody is driving away. Some will leave in ambulances, one dies at the hospital. Collision results in damage to the vehicles and the occupants in each vehicle. The crash forces injuries to the occupants. 
The other vehicle had multiple people inside, one with no seatbelt in use. The second driver could have avoided the collision, following too closely and driving too fast. Bad decisions that limit response time while driving. The occupants of the vehicles are all stunned, hurt, and scared. As the two vehicles collide, two of the occupants are thrown from the vehicle. Through the front windshield, the asphalt road surface is hard and cold. Not wearing your seatbelt only increases your chances of being ejected from the vehicle. The aftermath of the collision sends debris flying everywhere. There is an eerie silence that follows the collision. A resident close by hears the sound of an accident and calls for help. The 911 dispatcher sends police, fire, and ambulance. Police arrive on the scene. The first officers begin to check the scene for safety, looking for leaking gas, electric hazards, and discharged occupants. The officers observe the injured persons and request more assistance from other police departments. One person is found on the roadway with severe head injuries. The officer checks for a pulse and continues to check for other victims. crew arrives on scene. The police officers direct them to the two vehicles. The ambulance crew chief requests a medevac helicopter to be put on standby as they check the other injured victims. The medics find one victim that needs to be flown to a trauma center due to severe injuries. The medic requests the helicopter to fly. The helicopter should be here in 10 minutes. A police officer smells leaking gasoline. The fire company is advised and they arrive to help. The fire company arrives and begins to control the leaking gas. The scene has to be made safe for all. A victim from one of the vehicles begins acting irrationally.
The victim has to be comforted and controlled by a police officer. The victim tries to get to the vehicle and begins to interfere with the rescue workers. More police officers arrive to assist in the collision investigation. The ambulance crew continues to move the victim away from the initial crash scene from a trauma flight. The fire company sets up a landing zone close to the scene. The fire chief needs more help and summons another fire crew. The police officers continue their on-scene investigation. The officers must determine how the collision occurred. One of the officers detects the odor of alcoholic beverages and slurred speech from the 18-year-old female driver. They discover the driver was driving too close to the car in front and rear-ended the car. The officer detains that driver. The ambulance crew has the flight patient ready to fly. The detained driver is joined by another police officer. The officers conduct initial field sobriety tests that conclude with the arrest of the driver. Upon arrest, pills were found in the pocket of the driver. The officer recognizes the pills as Oxycot. The driver is placed into custody and prepared for transport to the hospital where blood evidence will be taken for prosecution. Thank you. 
The other victims are moved from the vehicle and their parents are called to come to the scene. The other victims were unaware that the driver had taken pills along with the alcohol. The helicopter begins its circle of the crash scene for landing. The helicopter lands and the ambulance crew wheel the victim away.
The victim is loaded by the helicopter crew and medics. One of the most severely injured dies. Injury is both physical and mental. The effects of both are long lasting. The flight crew and ambulance load the victims into the ambulance for transport to the hospitals. The firefighters complete the job of securing the gas leak. The police continue to investigate the collision. Many hours will follow the on-scene investigation. Criminal charges against the, the driver for both DUI and driving while under the influence of a controlled substance and homicide by vehicle will follow. Lives are changed forever. The driver that caused the DUI collision will have time to think and soul search in a three foot by five foot cell. DUI is avoidable. DUI is a crime. And DUI costs lives. Think to live. Don't drive drunk. What you have witnessed, folks, is just the beginning for some of the individuals who are involved in a situation like this. You saw the victims transport. Let's try again. There we are. You saw the victims transported to the hospital, and you saw the captor fly away. What you haven't seen yet is the aftermath in the court system for those who were driving and those who were involved. And we have a speaker here today. I have Judge Andrea Hudak Duffy from Montgomery Township. She's the District Justice. And after the initial impact of an accident, those who were driving, those who were involved, those who were intoxicated, uh, they end up in front of Dr. Artur, in front of Judge Duffy. So here she is, Judge Andrea Duffy. Mm -hmm. 
I recognize some of you today because my daughter is a senior here, and I have a sophomore here too. But unfortunately, I recognize some of you, and I'll try not to make eye contact with you because you've been in my court. You know who you are. Don't raise your hand. Um, but hopefully, you'll never be in my court again, and hopefully you've learned something from the experience. And I'm really glad to see you here today, those of you especially who've been in my court for underage drinking, because it means you're here, you're alive, and you're well. I've been a district attorney, I've been a private attorney, and now I'm a judge in my fourth year. And in those 25 years of practice, I've seen some of the most disgusting, horrible incidents where the pain will never, ever go away for the victims. Uh, for those of you uh, who haven't been involved with the court system, and I'm going to concentrate today mainly on underage drinking because I think that's where the nightmare usually begins that you just saw, I'm going to give you a little heads up on what happens. Police arrive at what usually is a, an underage drinking party that can be very scary and chaotic. They'll give you a breath test. If you even have a tiny bit of alcohol in your system, they're going to cite you. They're going to call your parents and they're going to come and get you at the police station. And you end up with a night that will change your life forever. And you may balk and say, big deal. Well, no, it is a big deal. And when you come in front of me, I'll make it a big deal because I don't want this big deal to happen. <clears throat> your driver's license is suspended, even if you don't even have a driver's license yet. You're put in the system and you have a record. Your ability to participate in school activities is also jeopardized. I do have an ongoing relationship with your principal and that will continue. Last year, in my own neighborhood, an underage drinking party occurred that scared the hell out of me. Uh, in the middle of the night, I was awakened from a wonderful slumber to sign a search warrant for a home. Frantic parents were calling their children who were trapped in a basement of this home. The party givers did not want those people out of the basement because they were afraid they were going to tell the truth of what was happening at that party. There was complete chaos when the police arrived with that warrant. No parent was home. All the doors were locked. All the windows were locked. Police couldn't get in without that warrant. <clears throat> when they arrived, they saw students your age and younger face planted in the yard in their own vomit. There were some serious cases, alcohol poisoning, and some very, very frantic parents. Some of you were there. Happened right here, folks, right here. Not in some crappy part of Philadelphia, not uh, you know far, far away, right here. At these parties, drinks are spiked, young people are drugged, and serious crimes occur. You might not think it's gonna happen to you, but it does. Women are raped. Everyone can be a victim of robbery, assaults. Victims are defenseless because they're so impaired and often quickly impaired. I hate to think of people who are used to drinking, but if you're not, you have no idea how alcohol is affecting you. And what happens in court often is that young people tell me they don't even know what they were drinking. Oh, it was a clear liquid. Uh, it was beer, I think. Um, I'm not sure. What's wrong with you? I say to them. You don't even know what you're putting in your own body? Well, I thought it was punch, but it tasted funny, but I kept on drinking it. I, if you ever come to my court, and I invite you to, you'll be amazed at some of the, the nonsense that comes out of people's mouths. And these are intelligent, good students like many of you. I'm shocked. As a parent, I'm shocked. I'm, as an experienced professional in this uh, criminal justice system, I'm still shocked at the answers that I get. You make yourself a victim. Remember that. You make yourself a victim. And then there's someone I'll call Jane. 
Jane came to me when I first started as a judge, so that's almost three and a half years ago. And she was just cited for underage drinking. Jane now is a heroin addict. Jane cuts regularly. Jane just got her first DUI at 17. Jane is someone who lives in my heart every day. I have cried many tears over Jane. I don't know what's gonna happen to Jane, but it all started with underage drinking and I'm doing everything and so are every authority I can find to help her to get out of this awful, awful cycle. But it started with that first stupid drink because she was hanging out with the wrong people. You know, as you go through your life and in this very, very competitive world, and it's so much more competitive than when I left high school, you're going to be fighting tooth and nail for scholarships, promotions, and college admission. And I say to every defendant who comes into my court, and that's what you're called, by the way, as soon as you're cited, you're a defendant. Do you like that name? I don't like that name, but that's what you are. I tell them there are two piles of people in this world. After you are looking for the future from high school, there's the pile of people who have those scars, retail theft, underage drinking, DUIs, disorderly conduct, any other kind of juvenile crime. And then there's the pile of people who don't have any of that. Which pile do you want to be in? When you want that money, when you want that college admission, when you want that promotion in life, is it worth being in the bad pile, really, over a drink? Is drinking worth losing your license, your reputation, your parents' respect, your future, your life? Choose the right pile today. Choose the right pile at your prom. Choose the right pile in college when all those drinking parties will be right there for the taking. Choose the right pile for your life. Please feel free to come visit me in court. I'm at 309 in Richardson. I think it would be an eye-opening experience, but don't be called a defendant in front of me, please. All right, and each year, I hope that when I do this as speech, I don't recognize anyone. All right, good luck to you in the future, and please, Choose that right pile. Thank you, Judge Duffy. This is a time for reflection. We take time out of school so that we can do this reenactment so that as we move into prom season and we move into graduation season and those high temptations, you'll think. You'll make the right decision. It's about making the right decision. That's what you heard from Judge Duffy. If you watched and you paid attention to what was happening here, make the right decision, folks. We want you safe. We want you sound. We want you able to move on after high school into whatever that dream job is, whether it's college or the military, whatever. We want you there, and we want you in good shape for that. I would just want to take a moment before we dismiss to say thank you to all of the police officers who are involved today, all of the fire folks, all of the uh, emergency personnel. They took time out of their day to be here so that you will think and you will make the right decision. The other thing I'll say to you is look at the number of folks who were involved in one accident the number of people who, whose lives are interrupted in order to respond to that accident, and then, of course, the number of folks whose lives are impacted by that accident. So all we ask you to do is think before you act, make good decisions. Okay, with that, we are going to return to third period. So I'm going to begin by dismissing section five first. Section five. And section three, we're going to let you go as well. We're going back, you're in three. Remember the dismissal. Dismissal period four will be the order.